losses and things which they have. For example, the emergency rooms lose a lot of money. So I understand that. And also the equipment is phenomenally expensive. This particular hospital that I'm talking about probably has a couple million dollars invested in their hyperbaric department. So somehow they have to make up for that. They have to, uh, you know, most of them borrow the money to build something like that. So they have extremely high monthly payments and all. How long has it been around? Uh, This question is asked me all the time. And I've heard doctors get up at conventions and say, well, this hyperbaric newfangled therapy or this is a new therapy without uh, any real experience. The first hyperbaric chamber was built in 1662. Wow. 1662, I believe the man's name was Henshaw in Europe. And they didn't understand the workings of oxygen, but somehow they got the uh, the information that pressure was or could be a good thing for illnesses and for the body. Well, what was happening, although they didn't know it, <clears throat> is that there's 21% oxygen in the air, ambient oxygen present in the air. And when you go in a pressurized environment with air only, you are bound to dissolve more of the air into the body because because there's 21% oxygen present in that air. So people were getting better, and, you know, it was kind of fun. And I, I, They had bellows. They didn't have any electric uh, compressors. They didn't have any equipment that we have today. Uh, but they had lots of... Uh, of great organs in Europe, you know, musical organs. Yes. The great cathedrals had uh, big ones. They required lots and lots of air pressure. So they developed very efficient bellows. So using the same technique to pressurize the chamber and to have guys pumping these bellows, you can imagine uh, the ancient ships, how you had two, three hundred guys underneath with these big oars. You probably have seen it in movies. Indeed. Well, you can imagine that uh, then uh, you had some men pumping bellows to create pressure for the first hyperbaric chamber. So this went on, used uh, by people, and caught on little by little by little. And then in, uh, in 1776, they were able to begin the process of uh, isolating oxygen, which means that you could create higher levels of oxygen than 21%. So at that point, you find uh, lots of uh, of oxygen dissolving into the blood that wasn't dissolving into the blood before, and that's one of the things that is very important because that was a milestone in hyperbarics. And from then on, hyperbarics would die and come back into uh, the forefront and die and come back into the forefront. And and then uh, in the 30s and 40s, uh, got a little popular here. There was a hyperbaric hotel built in... Um, in Cleveland, Ohio, it was a 12-story round structure made out of steel, of course. And in the lobby, they had a compartment that you could go in and out of and, and not have to depressurize the entire hotel. And that was uh, popular for a while. And that sounds pretty wild. It was very <laughs> wild. And, and actually, you know, there's something, there's something that's happening now that I really am very happy about, and that is at this point, we're beyond opinion in so many areas of hyperbarics. It's not a matter of, well, we think this and we think that. It's a matter of being able to uh, do spec scans and brain analysis and really determine that we're doing some good on a scientific level. Then other people don't laugh at us. You've been doing this an awful long time, and you've trained with the leaders in the field. You are a leader in the field. What do you say when people say, well, what about ozone therapy? Well, how does this relate to ozone therapy, and how is it different? Ozone is O3. Oxygen is O2. So ozone is a stronger form, if you want to refer to it as a form of oxygen. It can be toxic. It can be uh, harmful. Um, it can cause a great deal of harm. It can certainly exacerbate your lungs. Um, it can also uh, treat the blood and oxygenate the blood. You, know, you can take the blood out of the body, ozonate it, put it back, and you'll have a very positive effect if you do it properly. Um, so it has value. Ozonation has value. For some reason, we don't seem to uh, smile upon it in the United States. 
and I'm not sure why. I have no idea why. I don't know whether it's political. I don't know whether it's because it does have a capacity to be dangerous, but so does hyperbarics. Hyperbarics, because of the complexity of the equipment and the knowledge and training needed to run the equipment, if you don't know what you're doing, you can have a problem. And so we try to avoid that by... by uh, regimenting the training programs and certifying the people who run the chambers and that kind of thing. But both of them increase oxygen levels. Both of them are, are antimicrobial um, healing-oriented therapies. I think hyperbaric oxygen therapy overall is a more complete therapy. I think that it is a therapy that uh, doesn't really have too many side effects at all. Um, if you follow proper protocol, you shouldn't have any side effects, basically, other than perhaps some uh, uh, uncomfortable ears, which would be mimicking the same thing that would happen if you flew in an airplane and you came down from 40,000 feet to land at sea level. Your ears are going to get plugged up, and that's going to happen to you in a chamber as well. And that's one of the common side effects, but that's not dangerous. It's a little bit inconvenient for a while. So let's talk about how these sessions are spread out for the audience. Yes. Okay. How do you phase them? Well, uh, you got to you got to keep the body oxygenated and keep the oxygen levels at uh, a high pitch for a period of time to evoke some healing. So, if a patient had for example uh, been told that they have to have an amputation because uh, of a certain diabetic problem developing non-healing wounds and you know that it's going to probably end up with gangrene and an amputation will be imminent. Then uh, we would look at the we would look at the wound, we'd assess it, and we'd say, okay, probably probably twenty treatments uh, is where we need to go, so we can analyze it further. And we want to do it every day except Sunday. If we can do it on Saturday, it's fine. If they can't, we can skip the two days. But I'd rather I'd rather do uh, Saturday and skip Sunday uh, for the the first phase of the treatment. So daily is better. A person with a stroke, it's the same way. Daily is better. If a person can't do it daily, I think they should do it daily for maybe two weeks and then maybe three times a week with a lot of therapy and hard, hard work. When you're trying to do something physical like that, that's very, very important. For children with autism, with cerebral palsy, you know, cerebral palsy is a very interesting condition. It is a lack of oxygen during the birthing process for the most part. And in, uh, in Russia, uh, there, was a, there, there is still a, a really beautiful hyperbaric hospital. Uh, my friend, Dr. Ufini, uh, ran that for a long time. He recently retired. And in this hyperbaric hospital, they have surgical chambers, big hyperbaric chambers in which they do surgery. They have birthing chambers, birthing chambers specifically for giving birth. They have special chambers for brain issues, brain treatment that go down to seven atmospheres of pressure, which is very, very deep. They have other areas. There's a, at the hospital, there's a department for animals. All day long from early morning until late at night, people bring their animals for treatment in the hyperbaric chamber when they get in fights, when they get in wrecks, when they get hurt, whatever. It's an amazing process. I've never heard of it. Where in Russia is it? It's right in Moscow. I have a <clears throat> very poor quality um, video that we made there years ago uh, that is magnificent. It's absolutely magnificent. Should we uh, have the privilege of uh, being together sometime soon, I'll bring it to you and show it to you. I would love it. Uh, the chambers are magnificent. And uh, they do, uh, in this particular area, have this uh, birthing chamber. And the birthing chamber is used whenever there is a suspicion, whenever there is a suspicion that there might be oxygen deprivation during the birthing process. And when they do that, they eliminate, when they give birth in the chamber, they eliminate the possibility of CP or cerebral palsy occurring because the woman is so highly oxygenated, her blood is so highly oxygenated with transfers to the child, the child can be... Uh, born uh, and, and go through oxygen deprivation and not be deprived because of the high levels of concentration. And it's also kind of fun to remember that in the early days of open heart surgery, they could uh, 
they could treat someone in a hyperbaric chamber and saturate them with oxygen.